creation of the next Star Fox game began with Shigeru Miyamoto asking Takaya Imamura for a radical course change. Up until this point, the series fit comfortably into the rail shooter genre. The next Star Fox, however, would ditch the familiar formula in favor of a new genre. Imamura and Kazuaki Morita, the two creators who helped make Star Fox 64 a smash hit, got to work planning a new entry in the franchise that pulled Fox McCloud out of his R-Wing and featured ground-based third-person shooting. The Nintendo 64 was nearing the end of its life cycle and many of Nintendo's best and brightest were already shifting their attention to new Mario and Zelda projects for the upcoming successor to the console, the GameCube or as it was known at that time, Project Dolphin. This new Star Fox title remained locked onto Nintendo's 64-bit hardware though, despite the GameCube's launch drawing ever closer. As development continued, Miyamoto presented Imamura with a more efficient path forward that would combine his initial work on this new Star Fox with another game already in progress by Nintendo's longtime second-party developer, Rare. Rare, a developer based in the UK, began its relationship with Nintendo in the mid-80s. Much like how Argonaut had impressed Nintendo by reverse engineering a Game Boy, Rare reverse engineered Nintendo's Japanese Famicom console to understand how it worked and start making their own games without an official dev kit. This won Rare a great deal of respect and financial backing from the video game giant, helping the company define themselves as a major developer on the NES. In the mid-90s, Rare's work creating pre-rendered 3D visuals with silicon graphics computers convinced Nintendo to eventually buy a 49% stake in the company, making Rare an official second-party Nintendo developer. This also earned them the right to use one of Nintendo's most iconic characters to create the Donkey Kong Country trilogy for the Super NES. With longtime third-party developers like Capcom and Squaresoft abandoning Nintendo in favor of the additional storage available on CD-based media and the gentler publishing restrictions offered by Sony and Sega on their 32-bit consoles, it was Rare that helped bolster the Nintendo 64's library, delivering some of the biggest games on the system like GoldenEye 007, Blast Core, and Diddy Kong Racing, all of which were released in 1997 alone. And now, at the tail end of the N64's lifespan, a new project called Dinosaur Planet was to be Rare's swan song on the system, pushing their years of Nintendo 64 know-how to the limit for one last adventure on the console. Development on Dinosaur Planet began as soon as Diddy Kong Racing was completed. The group who crafted Diddy's kart-based adventure were split into two teams, with some members moving on to the project that would eventually become Jet Force Gemini, and the others being assigned to Dinosaur Planet. The original plan would have seen Timber the Tiger from Diddy Kong Racing take a starring role in Dinosaur Planet as a time-traveling adventurer. But as development progressed toward a game told through two characters with interwoven stories, Timber was dropped. Instead, Dinosaur Planet would be explored by two anthropomorphic heroes, Saber, a wolf, and also a nod to Rare's 1984 game Saber Wolf, and Crystal, a fox. Each would have a unique dinosaur sidekick and special abilities to aid them throughout their journey. Players would be able to switch back and forth between playing as Saber and Crystal by visiting certain locations around the map called Swap Stones. Additionally, the game would feature real-time expressions and extensive voice samples. To fit all of this into the game, Dinosaur Planet was planned to make use of the N64's 4-megabit RAM expansion pack and release on a 512-megabit cartridge, the largest available for the console. Nintendo's The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time proved massively influential to the development of the game, which eventually featured combat, exploration, and even Z-targeting mechanics more than just a little reminiscent of Link's first 3D outing. By the year 2000, the team working on Dinosaur Planet had finished a demo ahead of the next E3, which was to be shown off at the event alongside Rare's Perfect Dark and Conker's Bad Fur Day, two titles also for the Nintendo 64. Plans changed suddenly though, when Nintendo called a meeting with Rare during E3 to discuss the demo. The project had reached Shigeru Miyamoto, who had noticed the striking similarity between the game's protagonist Saber and Fox McCloud. 
despite Imamura already working on an adventure-based follow-up to Star Fox 64, Miyamoto suggested marrying Imamura's project with Dinosaur Planet, merging Rare's magnum opus on the Nintendo 64 with the Star Fox franchise and combining efforts across both teams. Shortly after E3 2000, lead artist Kevin Bayliss, director Lee Shuneman, and other members of Dinosaur Planet's development team found themselves bound for Nintendo's headquarters in Kyoto, Japan, for a week of meetings with Miyamoto and Imamura. Their goal was to work out the best way to pull the Star Fox universe into the Dinosaur Planet project. First and foremost, Saber the Wolf would be replaced with Fox McCloud as the main protagonist. Some of the game's characters were cut entirely like Saber's father Randorn, and others were completely reworked like Crystal the Fox, who would receive a more mature design with risque clothing inspired by the American comic book series Vampirella. The swap stone that originally allowed players to switch between controlling Saber and Crystal became the Warp Stone, allowing Fox to travel to the various areas of Dinosaur Planet. Much deliberation was also made about Fox's primary weapon for the game. Imamura's plan for his original project was that Fox use a gun, but that really didn't fit into the Dinosaur Planet design. A sword and shield were also considered, along with a whip, but ultimately it was decided to equip Fox with Crystal's staff, which would serve multiple purposes like fighting off enemy attackers, lifting objects to reveal secrets, and acquiring new abilities which unlocked the path forward as the game progressed. Flight sections were also tacked on, where players would briefly pilot the series' familiar R-Wing space fighter en route from one part of Dinosaur Planet to another, helping the game feel more like a part of the Star Fox universe. Nintendo in Japan and Rare in the UK would trade ideas and iterations back and forth via email, in addition to staffers spending plenty of time with each other in person. As producer on the project, Imamura would travel to England multiple times to fine-tune design decisions and ensure that development remained on schedule. He wasn't the only Nintendo staff assisting with the game, but just like Star Fox 64, he influenced multiple aspects of the project, including the graphics and music, as well as overhauling the narrative structure to make the game fit within the established Star Fox narrative. While many of the ideas from Imamura's original project were scrapped to fit Dinosaur Planet's game structure, the idea of setting the plot several years after Star Fox 64 remained intact. Eight years had passed since Team Star Fox defeated Andros and saved the Lilat system. While Fox McCloud and his crewmates were still revered as heroes, a lack of galactic conflict left the team scrounging for mercenary work to pay the bills. The Great Fox was in a state of disrepair, and Falco had gone missing, seemingly abandoning the team out of sheer boredom. In the midst of this tedium, the team received a call to action from General Pepper. Dinosaur Planet was in peril. The tyrannical General Scales had declared war on the other dinosaur tribes and wrought havoc on the planet itself by ripping off four large sections of it and setting them adrift in space. It would be up to Team Star Fox to reunite the disparate landmasses and stop the evil General Scales who was working in league with another familiar antagonist. The combined effort between Rare and Nintendo would ultimately result in the project moving to Nintendo's upcoming GameCube instead of the planned release on the N64 and being renamed to Star Fox Adventures. This decision surprisingly did not happen until later into development, after the cast of Star Fox had already been incorporated into the project. In February of 2021, gaming preservationists Force of Illusion acquired a December 2000 N64 development build of Dinosaur Planet from a private collector and shared it online. The most notable feature from this early build was that Fox McCloud had already replaced Saber as a playable protagonist, suggesting that the move to the GameCube happened sometime later than the decision to merge Dinosaur Planet with the Star Fox franchise. This flew in the face of the commonly accepted timeline, with most believing that the choice to transfer the project to the GameCube and include Star Fox characters happened at the same time. According to Kevin Bayliss, the initial plan was to create a game that would be known as Star Fox Adventures Dinosaur Planet and to release it on the Nintendo 64. Eventually, the Dinosaur Planet subtitle was dropped and the game officially moved to Nintendo's new hardware. 
after its lengthy development came to an end, Star Fox Adventures hit store shelves in September of 2002, about a year after the GameCube's launch, quickly selling more than 200,000 copies in Japan in its first weeks, and earning $30 million in sales in the United States by 2006. Reviewers criticized the game's disconnect from the series' rail shooter formula established in the previous games. They also called out the shoehorning of the Star Fox franchise into a game that had already been marketed as an original title, with some outlets even suggesting that Fox was on Dinosaur Planet at Nintendo's request, and not because he belonged there. The same month that Star Fox Adventures hit store shelves, Microsoft officially purchased Rare for the dizzying sum of $377 million to develop games for their upcoming Xbox home console. Rare's swan song for the GameCube became a final definitive note on its decades of work with Nintendo as a second-party developer. For fans, Star Fox Adventures represented a first and final look at what the studio that had bolstered the Nintendo 64 library with numerous hits might have achieved with the comparatively advanced hardware of the GameCube. While Rare's time with Nintendo was over, they left an indelible mark on the Star Fox franchise in the form of Crystal, now an official member of Team Star Fox. With Rare out of the picture, the franchise's next entry would fly much closer to the series' on-rails shooter origins, with a little help from a developer well-established in the space shooter genre, Namco. In March of 2001, Nintendo's longtime competitor, Sega, discontinued their final home console, the Dreamcast, and restructured into a third-party developer. This presented an opportunity to turn the two companies' rivalry into a mutually beneficial relationship. In February of 2002, Nintendo announced they were collaborating with not only Sega, but also one of their longest third-party partners, Namco, to build an arcade system based on the GameCube's hardware. In honor of the three developers working together, this arcade system was named the Triforce, after the magical MacGuffin prominent in the Legend of Zelda franchise. The trio of game companies imagined an ultra-efficient future where almost every game was a chance to kill two birds with one stone. The Triforce system's hardware was so close to the GameCube's that every project created for the arcade board could easily have a console counterpart, or vice versa, with a minimal amount of additional development time or resources spent. The best example of this concept in action was Sega's take on the F-Zero franchise. Created under the guidance of Nintendo's Takaya Imamura and Toshihiro Nagashi, the president of Sega subsidiary Amusement Vision, and the man who would later go on to create the Yakuza series. Nagashi had cut his teeth as a designer on Sega's Virtua Racing arcade game before later directing Daytona USA, one of the company's most successful and well-known racing titles. Now, he wanted to bring the high-speed thrill of Nintendo's F-Zero series not only to arcades, but also to Nintendo's GameCube by using the Triforce arcade system. F-Zero GX hit GameCubes in Japan in the summer of 2003, launching alongside its arcade counterpart F-Zero AX. The arcade machine accepted Nintendo GameCube memory cards, bringing a connection between the two games by letting players unlock F-Zero AX exclusive cars and tracks for use in the home version of the game, while also allowing them to bring their tuned-up F-Zero GX racers to the arcade and compete against other players. Namco wanted to produce a similar symbiotic relationship between the arcade and the home console using a certain group of space mercenaries hailing from the Lilat system. On May 8, 2002, they held a joint press conference with Nintendo to officially announce the next two Star Fox games, a second title for the GameCube with a corresponding arcade counterpart. The series that had originally drawn inspiration from Namco's arcade space shooters Starblade and Solvalu would receive two new games with Namco at the helm. There was just one problem. While the home console side of Namco's Star Fox project would see a release, its arcade counterpart sadly never made it off the runway. Details as to why the game was cancelled or what Namco was planning are virtually non-existent, at best 
tenuous answers for what might have been can be found in the game Nintendo and Namco would ultimately release as Star Fox Assault on the GameCube. Under the project name Star Fox Armada, development on Assault began six months after Star Fox Adventures was released. Once again, Shigeru Miyamoto would step in with a directive to help shape the project. Miyamoto wanted Imamura to make Star Fox quote-unquote cooler than ever before. Imamura also knew that fans were itching for the shooter gameplay the series had become known for prior to Star Fox Adventures. These two core ideas of creating a cooler Star Fox game with an emphasis on shooting action would influence every design aspect of the game, including the principal cast's new look, its music that combined an orchestral score with pulse-pounding drums, and a storyline featuring a combination of familiar faces along with a new nefarious enemy. Star Fox Assault's story picked up right where Star Fox Adventures left off. A year had passed after Fox defeated a resurrected Andros at the climax of Adventures with a little help from Falco Lombardi. Crystal, who Fox rescued in the previous game, officially joined the team, taking Pepe's place as the fourth Arwing pilot in the squadron after he stepped down. With Andros gone, his nephew and former Star Wolf member, Andrew Oikany, gathered up the remnants of his uncle's forces and set about harassing the Lilat system once again. The very first level of Assault felt like a return to form for the series, with on-rails gameplay set against an epic galactic conflict, complete with squadrons of space fighters too numerous to count in capital ships firing constant barrages of destructive power. Though Oinkini was initially presented as the villain, he was quickly swept aside by Assault's true main antagonist, the Aperoids, a new insect-like menace determined to assimilate all lifeforms in the galaxy. This new threat would lead to a shaky alliance between Fox's crew and Team Starwolf, returning from Star Fox 64 with a new teammate, Panther. To combat the Aperoid invasion, Assault armed Fox and his team with guns. Lots of guns. Imamura's desire to see Fox blasting his way through a seemingly insurmountable enemy force may have been quashed for Star Fox Adventures, but Assault made his idea a reality. In addition to Fox's trusty blaster, players picked up machine guns, homing launchers, gatling guns, and a sniper rifle. In certain on-rails sequences, Fox would even ride on the wings of his teammates' R-wings while blasting incoming foes to bits with a plasma cannon. Assault cultivated a unique identity in the Star Fox franchise by being the only game that combined run-and-gun gameplay with vehicular combat. Star Fox 64 occasionally switched things up by having Fox swap his R-Wing for a Landmaster tank or the Blue Marine for a level or two, but Assault asked players to swap between third-person shooting on foot and piloting a vehicle on the fly to accomplish specific objectives within a single level. Deciding when to hoof it and when to hop back into the ship would be determined by the player, not scripted events. This concept of swapping from ground-based shooting to vehicular combat formed the core of Star Fox Assault's Versus mode. Up to four players could compete in stages pulled directly from Assault's campaign. Each match would see combatants take control of various Star Fox characters and attempt to defeat one another while racing to acquire vehicles and achieve victory with superior firepower. Additional weapons, playable characters, and multiplayer maps would be unlocked by continuously playing the multiplayer mode. Much like Star Fox 64, Assault's replayability was enhanced thanks to a medal system that awarded points based on player performance in each of the game's 10 missions. Collecting all silver medals or better would unlock Namco's arcade shooter Xevious in all regional versions of the game. In Japan, Famicom versions of Battle City, a top-down tank game, and Starluster, a first-person space combat title, were also possible to unlock. Collecting medals and special flags could also unlock characters and weapons in Versus mode, such as Wolf O'Donnell or the Demon Sniper Rifle that was capable of taking out a target with a single shot. Assault's heavy emphasis on multiplayer is perhaps the best guess we have for what the ill-fated Star Fox arcade machine might have been. Like F-Zero AX and GX, perhaps playing through the campaign and gathering medals would unlock different weapons and playable characters in the game's arcade counterpart. Since Namco and Nintendo's press conference in May of 2002, no additional details about Star Fox Assault's arcade counterpart have ever surfaced. No concept art, no demos, no whispers, and certainly no arcade machine.
While the arcade game remains steeped in mystery, Star Fox Assault for the GameCube launched first in North America, but not in retail stores. Instead, it would be available exclusively to rent for a two-week period at participating blockbuster and Hollywood video locations beginning on February 1st, 2005. It then hit store shelves on February 14th in North America, followed shortly by a Japanese release on February 24th, and finally launched worldwide in mid-June. Whether or not Assault's two-week rental exclusivity deal hurt its sales at retail is anyone's guess, but regardless, it still sold well enough to make it into the player's choice line of Nintendo titles on the GameCube. Critics applauded the game's orchestral soundtrack, focus on multiplayer, and the ability to switch between vehicles on the fly, but ultimately found the on-foot sections tedious and out of step with the on-rails shooter action the series seemed to be drifting farther away from. With the next generation of consoles primed to launch, Star Fox Assault faded from view as did the once announced Star Fox arcade game. The franchise was far from grounded though, as Fox's next outing would arrive on Nintendo's latest handheld to complete the storyline started in Star Fox 64, with a little help from one of the series' original creators. By the end of 1995, Star Fox and Star Fox 2 lead programmer Dylan Cuthbert was looking for a change. For the past few years, he had worked as one of a handful of Argonaut programmers who had relocated to Nintendo's Kyoto headquarters to make games utilizing the Super FX chip. With the completion and subsequent shelving of Star Fox 2, Argonaut's contract with Nintendo had reached an end, and Cuthbert was free to strike out on his own. He had grown enamored by the cutting-edge visuals of games like Ridge Racer on the original PlayStation that brought arcade-quality graphics into the home. So enamored, in fact, that he took a job with Sony Interactive Studios America, where he would spend the next two years working as lead programmer on a 3D action platformer called Blasto for the PlayStation 1. But the allure of Japan, which Cuthbert once described as a mecca for gamers, proved too strong, and once development wrapped on Blasto, he transferred to Sony Japan. There, he developed tech demos to help sell the advanced hardware of the upcoming PlayStation 2 to game developers, while also working on the first Ape Escape game for the console, the Japan-exclusive People Saru 2001, generally referred to as Ape Escape 2001 in the West. On August 9, 2001, Dylan Cuthbert founded Q Games, a development studio based in Kyoto, Japan. The fledgling studio spent its earlier years acquiring talent and building tech demos for clients such as Microsoft and Sony. The studio's first game was a puzzle title released as part of the Japan-exclusive Bit Generations series of budget Game Boy Advance games. Digidrive tasked players with propelling a disc-shaped object called a Corvetto as far as possible by directing objects of various shapes into four lanes. During production of Digidrive, Shigeru Miyamoto approached Cuthbert about launching a new Star Fox on Nintendo's upcoming dual-screen handheld, the Nintendo DS. With the benefit of dev kits for the new handheld provided directly by the source and no reverse engineering required this time, it only took the developers at Q Games a few months to build a working demo that played much like a level from the original Star Fox. But the technology built into the Nintendo DS offered several unique gameplay mechanics not possible in previous games in the franchise. And as a relatively early DS game, this new title needed to help sell the system's advanced features. This time, it was Imamura who stepped in with a course correction, suggesting that the game recycle some of the ideas from the previously scrapped Star Fox 2 and make better use of the DS stylus to create a full-fledged Star Fox experience. In addition to incorporating all of the technology packed into Nintendo's latest handheld, the game that would become known as Star Fox Command also tied up the series' plot threads in a story that picked up after the events of Star Fox Assault. With Andros long gone and the Aperoid invasion quelled, Team Star Fox went their separate ways. 
Pepe took over for Pepper as the new general of the Cornarian forces. Falco flew the coop seeking glory as he had during the events of Star Fox Adventures. Slippy Toad found love in the amphibian arms of series newcomer Amanda, and Team Star Fox's newest recruit, Crystal, left the team and cut off her relationship with Fox after a bitter disagreement. But a new threat was on the rise in the Lilat system, hailing from Andros's long-abandoned base of operations, the planet Venom. The Anglar army, led by Emperor Anglar, emerged from deep within Venom's polluted oceans to seize control of the Lilat system. With his team long gone, it was up to a lone Fox McCloud to stand up to a new enemy. Over the course of command, the separated members of Team Star Fox would fly to Fox's aid, along with new companions and familiar faces, making for a playable roster of 14 different characters, the largest of any Star Fox game. Newcomers like Slippy's fiance Amanda, Peppy's daughter Lucy Hare, and Andross's grandson Dash Bowman were introduced, while familiar faces from Star Fox 64 and Assault, including Team Star Wolf, would return as playable characters. Easily the biggest surprise on the roster was Fox's father, James McCloud. Much like its then-unreleased Super NES predecessor, Star Fox 2, Command featured levels with full 3D flight, dubbed All Range Mode, rather than the on-rails design of the original game and Star Fox 64. On-rails levels had a definitive starting and ending point, locking the player in for the duration with no place to take a break mid-level. This was fine for playing at home, but became a hindrance when navigating a daily commute or engaging in missions over a coffee break. Quick bite-sized all-range levels empowered players to self-serve how much time they wanted to spend during each play session. Designing command around the all-range mode presented a great deal of challenge when it came to perfecting its control scheme, however. With guidance from Miyamoto himself, Cuthbert and Q Games spent a great deal of time working out the controls. The team experimented with having players draw different shapes using the Nintendo DS stylus on the touchpad to perform Arwing maneuvers, such as a semicircle to initiate a U-turn or a full circle to do a barrel roll. Another experimental control scheme allowed the player to press and hold the stylus on an enemy's position on the map, initiating an autopilot mode where the R-Wing would circle around the enemy while the player inspected for weak points, a feature that would eventually be incorporated into a future Star Fox title. After lengthy experimentation, the team eventually settled on a drastically simplified control scheme where the stylus was used to maneuver the R-Wing, and all of the DS buttons, including the shoulder button and D-pad, would fire its lasers. This prevented the player from having to awkwardly hold the handheld while using the stylus to fully control the ship. It also made the game work for both right and left-handed players. The touchpad would serve multiple functions like displaying a radar for each stage, executing advanced flight maneuvers like loops and U-turns with a simple icon tap, and allowing players to drop bombs on enemy targets. All range mode was hardly the only idea recycled from Star Fox 2 though. Between stages, players would navigate the game via various map screens, prioritizing incoming enemy threats and thinking strategically while directing Fox and his wingmen. If players failed to engage an incoming enemy missile, for example, the Great Fox would take damage, leading to a game over. Colliding with an icon on the map would initiate an enemy encounter that might range from shooting down incoming missiles to attacking an enemy mothership. Where the whole of Star Fox 2 took place on a single map of the entire Lilat system, Command featured a map for each planet. After completing the game once, players could chart their own course through the Lilat system, engaging the game's various locations in a manner of their own choosing. The decisions they made would determine which of the nine possible endings they would see at the end of each playthrough. That's right, nine possible endings. While Star Fox Command did conclude the storyline that started with Star Fox 64 in 1997, none of the multiple endings are necessarily canon. Depending on player action, Crystal may become a disgraced vigilante living on the outskirts of the galaxy, or in a clear nod to F-Zero, Fox and Falco may join the G-Zero Grand Prix as racers, putting their mercenary lives behind them for good. Outside of the campaign, Star Fox Command presented another first for the series, online multiplayer. 
by connecting locally over Nintendo DS Download Play or going online with Nintendo's Wi-Fi connection, up to six players, four online and six for local play, could compete in aerial dogfights. Star Fox Command launched in late summer 2006 for most of the world, with a European release in January of 2007. Despite a return to form with additional help from one of the series' long-absent original creators no less, and franchise firsts including online multiplayer, Star Fox Command sold a grand total of an estimated half a million copies globally. This was particularly low for a big-name Nintendo series whose most divisive games on the underselling Nintendo GameCube had managed to easily move a million copies at least. With Star Fox Command fully launched, Q Games returned their focus back to developing original game concepts like their popular Pixel Junk series. The studio would occasionally return to Nintendo hardware, releasing downloadable games for the DSi, including a port of their first game, Digidrive, and even a follow-up to Dylan Cuthbert's 3D game on the original Game Boy, X. For X Returns, known as Escape outside of Japan, Cuthbert took on the role of art director, filling the game with monochromatic shaded polygons reminiscent of early computer graphics from movies like Tron. Q Games jumped back into the R-Wing's metaphorical cockpit once more to help sell the features of Nintendo's next handheld, the Nintendo 3DS, with a remastered version of Star Fox 64. Along with a top-to-bottom overhaul of the visuals that worked to great effect with the 3DS's built-in stereoscopic 3D mode, Star Fox 64 3D took advantage of the handheld's gyroscopic sensors, allowing players to control the R-Wing by simply tilting and moving the handheld itself. The game also reworked the multiplayer mode of the classic Nintendo 64 title, removing the Landmaster tank and on-foot combat of the original to focus exclusively on four-player aerial dogfights. Miyamoto had a lot riding on the success of Star Fox 64 3D, going so far as to tell Dylan Cuthbert during development that if the game didn't appeal to first-time players, Fox McCloud might have to hang up his wings permanently. When the game debuted in North America on September 9, 2011, critics nitpicked the lack of new content and the game's stubborn refusal to take the multiplayer mode online, a feature Star Fox Command had achieved five years earlier. Reviews did applaud the graphic improvements and dedication to recreating the original experience with pinpoint accuracy. Star Fox 64 3D marked the end of Dylan Cuthbert's involvement with the franchise he was instrumental in bringing to life in the early 90s, though the Star Fox series still had one surprise left in store for him in the form of a long-canceled game finally seeing the light of day. Star Fox's next mission would see the series thrust into a battle for relevance in an attempt to demonstrate the untapped potential of yet another piece of Nintendo hardware. The team of anthropomorphic animals had faced off against tyrannical monkey scientists, cybernetic insectoids, and aquatic emperors, but now the squad would do battle with a brand new foe, the Wii U Gamepad. By January of 2014, Nintendo's latest home console, the Wii U, was in trouble. While the Nintendo Wii's intuitive motion controls and casual market appeal had proved to be a lucrative combination, its successor, the Wii U, had fallen far short by comparison, with adoption rates of the new hardware much lower than Nintendo's own projections. In a financial results briefing held that January, Nintendo President Satoru Iwata provided insight into the Wii U's troubles as well as a possible solution. Both centered around the Wii U gamepad. Introduced in November of 2012, the Wii U's defining hardware feature was its curious gamepad. Shaped like a rounded tablet, the controller featured standard inputs including shoulder buttons, analog sticks, a D-pad, and face buttons with a 6-inch touchscreen sandwiched between them all. The utility, let alone the fun, of a second screen, particularly one that was low resolution and a bit fuzzy, was a tough sell 
The casual audience clinging to their Wiis didn't see much of a reason to adopt the new hardware, and the hardcore gaming crowd Nintendo was attempting to lure back by stacking its new console's library with third-party games that had also released on Sony and Microsoft's consoles weren't buying it either. By early 2014, the Wii U's library included only a few games that made use of simultaneous television and gamepad play in minor, gimmicky ways. Ubisoft's Zombie U, for example, required players to manage their inventory on the Wii U gamepad while keeping an eye on their televisions to avoid surprise zombie attacks. Iwata needed an essential gaming experience built wholly around the concept of dual-screen gameplay, much like they had done with the Nintendo DS, to demonstrate what the Wii U was truly capable of, and he needed it fast. He set Shigeru Miyamoto and his team to the task of creating such a game. They developed three of them. At E3 2014, Miyamoto unveiled these Wii U projects in a closed-door demonstration. The first, Project Giant Robot, put players behind the controls of a building-sized mech battling other robots and causing chaos through a cityscape. The second, Project Guard, was a type of tower defense game that tasked players with defending a base by switching between multiple laser-mounted cameras to blast invading robots. And finally, there was the return of Star Fox to a home console. Built using assets originally developed for a scrapped Star Fox game on the Wii, this tech demo on the Wii U featured a brand new control scheme. While the television provided a third-person view from behind the R-Wing, just like the Star Fox games of the past, the Wii U gamepad presented a first-person view direct from the cockpit. Players would use the left stick to pilot the R-Wing, similar to classic Star Fox gameplay, but this time the right analog stick, not the face buttons, would be used to boost, brake, and tilt the R-Wing left and right, as well as pulling off complex aerial maneuvers like U-turns, loops, and barrel rolls. The ZR button would fire the R-Wing's lasers, but in this game, the gyroscopic features of the Wii U gamepad would allow them to be aimed independently of the ship's trajectory. This made it possible to hit an enemy's weak spot from above, for example, by flying over the foe with the analog stick while simultaneously aiming the gamepad downward to fire laser blasts. Eventually, a co-op mode would be added that allowed one player to focus on shooting via the gamepad, while another player used the Wii U Pro Controller or the Wii Remote in a nunchuck to pilot the R-Wing. If this new control scheme sounds complicated, it was. And this unusual gameplay with two screens wasn't the only new concept Nintendo would ask players to come to grips with during the demonstration. Despite the fact that only one person could operate the Wii U gamepad at a time, it would be inaccurate to say that Nintendo intended the three demos to be only single-player experiences. Instead, a specific emphasis was placed on how the visuals of each of these games would appeal to an audience of observers watching only the TV. While the player blasted invaders in Project Guard with one camera-mounted laser, an audience could call out impending threats, giving the player a heads up about which camera to switch to next. Star Fox followed suit, with the camera angle during certain sequences designed to be more of a cinematic spectacle than functionally useful to the player, a concept Miyamoto referred to as target mode. This mode would kick in during certain boss battles, with the camera focused on the primary threat, but zoomed way out so that anyone watching the television could see the whole battle happening all at once. The actual piloting of the R-Wing to line up attack runs would be relegated to the Wii U gamepad. To ensure that the presentation of this new Star Fox game would be a sight to behold, Nintendo enlisted the aid of Platinum Games, a studio known for their over-the-top visual style and art direction, particularly in the action genre. The two companies would co-develop not one, but two games based on the tech demos Miyamoto unveiled in 2014. The Star Fox demo became Star Fox Zero, the series' first brand new entry in almost a decade, and Project Guard became Star Fox Guard, a tower defense game in which players helped Slippy's uncle, Grippy, defend his mining operations across the Lilat system from robotic invaders by taking control of numerous camera-mounted laser cannons. Unfortunately, Project Giant Robot was quietly cancelled. Nintendo approached Platinum Games about working on the next Star Fox game after the developer had incorporated an R-Wing-themed level into Bayonetta 2, the Wii U-exclusive second entry in the Bayonetta series. 
A level called Jet Fighter Assault appeared in the game which saw Bayonetta taking down enemies while on the back of a fighter jet. However, if players equipped Bayonetta with the Star Fox inspired space mercenary outfit, the fighter jet would instead become an R-Wing complete with bombs and homing shots, altering the level to feel like it was ripped straight out of Star Fox 64. Nintendo's decision to work with Platinum Games also came down to the company's commitment to making gorgeous and exciting visuals, an aspect Miyamoto was keen to improve in this new Star Fox title. Yusuke Hashimoto led the Platinum team as co-director on Star Fox Zero, as the studio handled all of the visual aspects of the game, including animations, character models, and backgrounds. Yugo Hayashi served as co-director from the Nintendo side with Shigeru Miyamoto heavily involved in the game's development as supervising director and producer. Takaya Imamura and Kazuaki Morita also returned once again, acting as supervisors on Star Fox Zero and helping polish the game's storyline. Zero would be a complete reboot of the series that cut ties with the narrative established in Star Fox 64 and concluded with Star Fox Command. Once again, the Lilat system was embroiled in a galactic conflict with the forces of Corneria facing off against the armies of the exiled simian scientist Andros. This time around, General Pepper didn't merely banish Andros to a distant planet, but used Andros' own technology to imprison him in an alternate dimension with the help of Fox McCloud's father, James McCloud, who was lost in the process. Five years later, Fox McCloud rebuilt his father's old squadron, Star Fox, with franchise usuals Peppy Hare, Falco Lombardi, and Slippy Toad. And he did so in the nick of time, too, as Andros began wreaking havoc via teleportation portals, the same technology which had been used to seal him away. Fox and his team were equipped with numerous vehicles to accomplish their mission and make the most of the title's two-screen gameplay. The R-Wing returned with the ability to transform into a bipedal walker as it had in the cancelled Star Fox 2. The walker could venture into tight spaces such as invading enemy battleships to take them down from the inside. The Landmaster tank also returned and was able to transform into a lumbering aerial vehicle, the Gravmaster. Two new vehicles were introduced as well. The Gyro Wing, a helicopter-like transport with the ability to airdrop a tiny robot called Direct Eye, which could hack computer systems using the Wii U gamepad screen, and the Roadmaster, a small all-terrain type vehicle piloted by the Direct Eye, made available exclusively in the game's training mode after completing the main campaign. The Wii U allowed for additional immersion and gimmicks not found in previous games, like 3D Voice that broadcast radio chatter during missions from the gamepad speakers instead of the TV, and Nintendo's popular plastic amiibo figures, which unlocked additional content, including a low-poly version of the R-Wing from Star Fox on the Super NES, and a black R-Wing, which could lock onto multiple enemies at once, though also took more damage. But all the nostalgic nods to the franchise's past and innovative of gameplay gimmicks couldn't shield Star Fox Zero from the turbulence it experienced ahead of its launch, both from the press and Nintendo's own plans for a Wii U successor. At a March 2015 press conference held to announce Nintendo's intentions to enter the smartphone gaming market, Satoru Iwata made a stunning announcement, development of a new dedicated gaming console, then referred to as the NX, but better known now as the Nintendo Switch, was already underway. The project was announced to calm fears that Nintendo might be shifting away from the hardware market. But the news also signaled that the Wii U, a system that was less than three years old at that point, was already on its way out. By June of 2015, Nintendo was laser-focused on building as much hype for Star Fox Zero at E3 as possible. They opted to make their big conference announcements not on the show floor, but digitally through pre-recorded video. Kicking things off were puppet versions of Satoru Iwata, Shigeru Miyamoto, and Nintendo of America president Reggie fils transforming into Peppy, Fox, and Falco respectively, produced by the Jim Henson Company no less, a callback to the Star Fox puppets Miyamoto created for the original Star Fox on the Super NES. What followed was a gameplay-filled hype trailer for Star Fox Zero, highlighting all of the vehicles, their various gimmicks, and the dual-screen control method, 
This, in turn, was followed by a video of Miyamoto, human this time, shot at the very Fushimi Inari shrine that inspired the original game. In this video, Miyamoto advocated for the added immersion of double screens in transformable vehicles. It was plain to see that games journalists were not exactly enthusiastic about either the two-screen gameplay of Star Fox Zero or the future of the console it was meant to invigorate. During E3, Nintendo's own Treehouse Live hosts couldn't even get to grips with the game's controls during their broadcast. A week after Nintendo's digital E3 event, Miyamoto appeared in Fortune in an article called Shigeru Miyamoto – Why the Wii U Crashed and Burned. A week after that, Polygon released an article criticizing Star Fox Zero for placing the need to make an experience unique to the Wii U in its gamepad ahead of every other aspect of the game. As months went by, the bad press continued to pile up, placing Star Fox Zero in Nintendo in a precarious position ahead of its launch. By that September, it was clear that Star Fox Zero was not going to hit its scheduled release target of the 2015 holiday season. In an official Nintendo statement, Miyamoto explained that more time was needed to ensure players would easily grasp the controls and to bring the game more in line with the formula established by Star Fox 64, a change longtime fans wanted. Adjustments made during this time included bringing back Nova Bombs and adding a map system to let players chart their course through the Lilat system, just like Star Fox's Super NES and Nintendo 64 entries. Fans would ultimately have to wait until late April of 2016 to play the first original Star Fox entry in a decade at that point. Players had the choice of buying Zero digitally or purchasing it physically either as a standalone Wii U game or packaged with Star Fox Guard. To help promote the game at launch, a short anime called Star Fox Zero The Battle Begins debuted online. The game received a mixed response from critics. Ironically, it was the very aspects of the game Nintendo delayed the release to fix that garnered the most criticism. The gamepad focused gyroscope control scheme and the game's insistence on trying to emulate Star Fox 64. Critics also expressed disappointment at the complete lack of a multiplayer mode beyond the co-op control method. With the exception of Star Fox Adventures, every game in the franchise had included some kind of multiplayer since Star Fox 64 in 1997. Even the most positive reviewers said they'd enjoyed the game despite the Wii U gamepad's confusing controls. This poor critical response translated to a financial situation bordering on anemic for a mainline Nintendo game. Estimates place Star Fox Zero's total sales at about 440,000 copies, making it the worst selling game in the franchise. In Japan, combined sales figures of both standalone copies of Star Fox Zero and copies bundled with Star Fox Guard topped out at slightly more than 25,000 copies in its first week. By comparison, Splatoon, an unestablished brand new game, sold roughly 145,000 copies, and Super Smash Bros. for Wii U sold about 228,000 copies in their first week in Japan. Nintendo attempted to counteract this situation by adding the complete Star Fox Zero training mode, a Star Fox Guard demo, and the Star Fox promotional animated short as a free, downloadable package on the Nintendo eShop in July of 2016. But this did little to help the dire situation. Star Fox Zero's position as the game Nintendo hoped would justify the unique experiences possible only on the Wii U gamepad intrinsically tied its legacy to the console it was meant to save, with neither able to find much success after such a bumpy timeline of events. Though a couple of other notable games would release after Star Fox Zero crashed and burned, the Wii U was hardly registering signs of life. Nine months after the game's release, and a little more than four years since the Wii U's debut, Nintendo officially announced it had halted production of the console on January 31st, 2017. The game that might have actually succeeded as the Wii U's killer app, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, instead became the proverbial final nail in the Wii U's coffin when it was simultaneously released on the Nintendo Switch on March 3rd, 2017. Despite Star Fox Zero's failure to take off on the Wii U, it's not difficult to find fans calling for the game to get a second wind on the Nintendo Switch. 
with even Imamura and Platinum Games expressing their desire to see it happen. Whether Star Fox Zero is truly grounded or primed to make a return remains to be seen, though at this point in time it is the last mainline title in the long-running franchise. Despite the game's lack of financial success, Team Star Fox would return for one final mission. This time, it would not be Nintendo in the cockpit, but a certain Canadian developer with an idea for combining arcade-like flight sim gameplay with collectible toys. In 2017, Ubisoft Toronto's Matt Rose took to the stage at E3 to announce a title that deviated sharply from the type of games his team had worked on most recently, including Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Blacklist, Far Cry Primal, and Assassin's Creed Unity. Starlink Battle for Atlas pitted a ragtag group of space explorers against the Forgotten Legion that aimed to conquer the Atlas star system. The game would take the open-world, numerous objective-clearing gameplay Ubisoft had developed a reputation for in their Far Cry and Assassin's Creed franchises and apply it to a third-person space shooter with a major twist. The ability to build custom spaceships, change weapon loadouts, and even switch pilots on the fly with hot swappable collectible toys. In a closed-door demo also at E3 2017, Ubisoft Toronto were able to show the game to a few Nintendo employees. The Nintendo folks would return to see the demo again numerous times, bringing increasingly more prominent Nintendo notables and translators each time. To say Starlink had piqued Nintendo's interest in those closed-door demos would be an understatement. Conversations continued after E3, eventually culminating in a team from Ubisoft Toronto traveling to Kyoto to pitch a collaboration directly to Shigeru Miyamoto and the Nintendo side of the original Star Fox development staff from the Super NES days. It's worth noting that although Nintendo was already partnering with Ubisoft on Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle, that game was produced by Ubisoft's Paris and Milan studios. Starlink Battle for Atlas and the pitch to include Star Fox in the game came directly from Ubisoft Toronto. This collaboration would result in a Star Fox appearance in Starlink that felt less like a mere cameo and more like a full-blown adventure post Star Fox Zero. For starters, physical copies of the game on Nintendo Switch came packaged with an Arwing toy and a Fox McCloud pilot figure. Players who picked up the PlayStation 4 or Xbox One versions of the game would receive the Zenith ship with pilot Mason Rana instead. Like all the Starlink ships, the Arwing toy could be equipped with various plastic weapons. Unlike the other ships, however, even if the weapon slots were empty, the Arwing could still use its classic beams and charge shot. Team Star Fox would also receive their own campaign and story content exclusive to the Nintendo Switch version of the game. Outside of these Star Fox-themed story missions, Fox McCloud remained a playable character for the entirety of the normal Starlink campaign as well. Starlink even included several of the Star Fox voice actors who had appeared in the games stretching back to Star Fox 64, reprising their roles. On October 16, 2018, Starlink Battle for Atlas released on the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch to reviews that weren't exactly out of this world. In early April of 2019, however, Ubisoft announced that Starlink had fallen far short of their sales expectations, and as a result that they were pulling the plug on manufacturing additional physical toys, including pilots, ships, and even weapon packs. The game continued to be supported digitally though, including still more Star Fox content as part of the game's Crimson Moon update. The DLC made Falco, Peppy, and Slippy playable, each with unique pilot abilities, and added the notorious rival pilots of Team Star Wolf as new opponents for Fox and his team. Despite a cold critical reception and sales that fell short of Ubisoft's expectations, Starlink Battle for Atlas remains the closest thing we've seen to a new Star Fox game since 2016's Star Fox Zero. While Starlink was the most robust Star Fox cameo, Fox McCloud and the rest of Team Star Fox have made numerous other appearances since the series' introduction in 1993. 
In Wild Tracks, better known as Stunt Race FX in the West, it was possible to make an R-Wing appear by crashing into the five Star Fox signs on the night cruise stage. In Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars, a model of an R-Wing could be seen in Hinopio's shop along with models of the Blue Falcon and Fire Stingray from F-Zero. A similar R-Wing statue could be placed as a piece of furniture in Animal Crossing New Leaf and appeared in other entries of the Animal Crossing series as well. F-Zero X on the Nintendo 64 introduced series mainstays James McCloud and Leon, named after Fox McCloud's father by the same name, and Star Wolf member Leon Pawalski. As the F-Zero series continued on the GameCube and Nintendo handhelds, James and Leon grew to look even more like their Star Fox counterparts, though in Leon's case he physically resembled Wolf O'Donnell rather than his chameleon namesake. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, a game in which Takaya Imamura was instrumental for art direction, featured five masks that seemed to reference specific Star Fox members in the player's inventory. The Keaton, Bremen, and Don Jero masks resembled Fox, Falco, and Slippy, respectively. The Bunny Hood resembled Peppy, and finally, the Mask of Sense resembled Pigma Dengar, who was canonically a member of the original Star Fox team in Star Fox 64. Fox McCloud continues to be an integral fighter in the Super Smash Bros. series since its debut on the Nintendo 64. Falco Lombardi and Wolf O'Donnell would appear as playable characters in later games, alongside other series staples like the Landmaster Tank, the Planet Corneria, and even Andross. Speaking of Andross, in the DSi exclusive Xscape, Q Games' follow-up to Dylan Cuthbert's Game Boy game X, the penultimate boss fight featured a floating head much like Fox's encounter with Andross in Star Fox. WarioWare Smooth Moves for the Nintendo Wii featured a Star Fox minigame in which players must pilot an R-Wing to the end of a stage and fight the Nintendo robotic operating buddy, aka Rob. This minigame would carry over to the Nintendo 3DS title WarioWare Gold. Several games also featured Star Fox themed costumes, including the Wii U version of Tekken Tag Tournament 2 and Monster Hunter Generations on the 3DS. In Super Mario Maker, Mario could take the form of all four of Team Star Fox's core members as well as the R-Wing and Walker from Star Fox Zero. On the 3DS, Street Pass Me Plaza featured Star Fox hats for Miis, which could be collected by playing the various Me Plaza games. Additionally, Me Plaza's Puzzle Swap contained a collectible puzzle that would make a three-dimensional diorama featuring Star Fox 64 3D when pieced together. Steel Diver Sub Wars featured a character eager to assist the player with helpful advice who looked an awful lot like Fox McCloud's mentor, Peppy Hare in addition to the Blue Marine from Star Fox 64 as DLC. Outside of cameo appearances, the legacy of Star Fox lives on in indie games and fan projects. Take X Zodiac, for example, a game that combines the best of Star Fox's low-poly graphics with a touch of Sega's Space Harrier complete with anthropomorphic animal pilots, on-rails action, and of course, barrel rolls. For those looking to revisit the Super NES original more directly, there's Star Fox EX. Released in November 2022, this ROM hack from Can Do Want To mods the original game to feature 15 additional levels, 2 to 5 player simultaneous play, new bosses, as well as the ability to play the game with a much improved frame rate compared to the original, and a whole host of other alterations. As for official releases, there's been precious little for fans to celebrate, save for Star Fox 2's inclusion on the Nintendo Switch Online service in December of 2019, making the game still more accessible than its 2017 official debut on the Super NES Classic Edition, now no longer in production. Whether Nintendo is readying Team Star Fox for a new adventure or even planning additional re-releases of previous games is, as of right now, anyone's guess. It cannot be denied, though, that Star Fox has crashed and burned more often than not in its later years, with no game in the series able to capture the success of the Super NES original or franchise-defining Star Fox 64. Equally undeniable is Nintendo's eagerness over the years to relaunch the series, particularly when they have a shiny new piece of hardware or creative idea to explore. 
from the Super NES original that pushed the absolute limits of Nintendo's 16-bit hardware to the fatally flawed but innovative Wii U game, Star Fox has earned its place as an essential series, critical not only to understanding the history of Nintendo, but the evolution of video games as a whole. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Uh, I want to give a huge shout out to Jonathan over at Life Begins at 8-Bit for being a massive part of this documentary and collaborating with me on this. Uh, he is a great streamer. He does a lot of video game history streams. There's a link to his Twitch in the description down below. Please check him out. Also, another big thanks to Joe After Work for helping me capture a bunch of footage that I didn't have. Uh, huge, huge help. Another amazing retro streamer. Please check him out on Twitch. Uh, link down below in the description. And finally, there's an extra bonus video if you click up above here of Jonathan and I talking about some of the extra facts and some of our thoughts that didn't quite make it into this documentary. So pretty cool little extra bonus video if you're interested in that. Anyways, thanks again for watching and I will hopefully see you again soon.